Thank you, Magna. So, as always, colorectal comes at the end. Um, <laughs> so, so, we'll try and get it done before morning tea. So, um, I've been given a topic of proctology, but I thought I'd... Proctology, obviously, for most of you guys, is patients turning up with rectal bleeding. So, I thought I'd talk about it, the approach to rectal bleeding. That's actually the more worrying concern for most people in terms of our cancer risk. And that's... Um, that's what we worry about mainly in our clinics is overriding concern, exclusion of a malignancy. So what are the causes of rectal bleeding? Obviously there's the anorectal problems, the local problems. I put fissure and ano first because that's actually the one that most often comes to our clinic with patients with pain. The patients will think they've got hemorrhoids but it's actually fissures causing it, so we'll come to that in a second. Hemorrhoids obviously, local problems from anal cancer which is rare but problematic and then the other bleeding issues, which is more of the concern, bleeding from higher up, so the rectum and colon, polyps obviously, cancers, big problem, inflammatory bowel disease, and then really the patients who have massive rectal bleeding who come up acutely into hospital, which I won't say too much more about. So rectal bleeding is an extremely common symptom, and unfortunately it's very hard to define which patients are going to have cancers. So who do we investigate? The history is important. Looking at the amount, the volume, the frequency, and the duration doesn't really give you much description between non benign and malignant stuff, but if it's been going for years, it's unlikely to be a big problem. Questions we most often ask is, is the blood anorectal in origin? So is it outlet-type bleeding, or is it coming from somewhere more proximal, which is obviously going to be more worrying for cancer? So looking at the colour, whether it's actually mixed in with the stool or just on the toilet paper, and the other thing to ask about is, is there mucus mixed in with it? That's worrying. That might be a cancer sitting there. Then the associated symptoms we're looking for is the change in bowel habit. All patients and most of my students will think it's constipation that they're looking for. Constipation is actually a very useless symptom to look for in terms of exclusion of malignancy. So more worrying is patients who have increased stool frequency, particularly if they've got a low volume stool, then you get very worried. So I'm going less frequently, I'm only passing, I mean going more frequently, passing a little bit of stool, and I've got bleeding and some mucus. I'd say that patient's got a 50% chance of having bowel cancer if they're in the age group. The other thing everybody wants to talk about is weight loss and anorexia. Actually useless. If they've got that and they've got cancer, they're probably dying. So for bowel cancer, that probably means you've got liver mets already. But, you know, worth asking. <clears throat> so then the examination, obviously do a general exam and abdominal exam. The abdominal exam is actually pretty useless as well. I use that as a handshake because it just seems a bit raw, raw, rude to put your finger up their bottom before you <laughs> take the patient. <laughs> but um, then the important thing is do a rectal exam. And as the old adage says, if you don't put your finger in it, you, you will put your foot in it. Of a UK series, over a third of patients who had rectal bleeding presenting with their bowel cancer had a palpable rectal mass. So as a third of those patients, you might be able to pick up their cancer when you just do a rectal exam. For you guys, do you need to do a proctoscopy? I don't actually think so. I think the it doesn't really change what you do. Not really. You might find some hemorrhoids. Does that really change what you do? Not really. We will when they come to clinic. And we'll obviously do a rigid sigmoidoscopy, which will look up to the top of the rectum, so the top, bottom 15 centimetres to exclude problems there. Um, so in terms of rectal bleeding, the risk of cancer in any patient over 40 coming along with rectal bleeding is about 3 to 5%. Um, with bleeding and a change in bowel habit, particularly with that increased frequency, you're doubling that risk, so worry about it, um, and particularly that looseness of stool. Tinnismus is the other symptom to ask about if patients say they go to the toilet and they always still feel there's something there. That's a worrying symptom also. The other thing to think about is iron deficiency, so it's worth getting a blood test. There always is a cause for iron deficiency, even if they've not got rectal bleeding, worry about it. In the non-menstruating patients, GI bleeding is the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia, and investigation must include a full colonic evaluation. So the Ministry of Health has got guidelines which came out this year in terms of those patients who get direct access for colonic evaluation. So that's with colonoscopy or CT colonography. Certainly there's a move within the, within the ministry that all patients get referred to a central point and then the gastroenterologist or whoever's doing the grading will then decide whether they should have a colonoscopy or CTC, which is equally good at detecting things. Um, and it's all about resource management, of course. So in terms of the 
two weak category patients who have bleeding and iron deficiency anemia, if you refer for a colonoscopy, should get that within two weeks. If they've got bleeding and a change in bowel habit and they're over 50 with loose and more frequent stools, not constipation, constipation sort of a, yeah, doesn't mean anything, then they will get it within two weeks. The six week category for those over 50, if you've got unexplained rectal bleeding and benign causes are treated or excluded, which is a very vague sort of thing and I think it's a bit pointless even trying, but if they've got obvious hemorrhoids, then they'll probably come directly to us, but pretty much we're gonna see them and gonna do a CT, colon CT or colonoscopy. Um, and then over 50 with a change in bowel habit, again with the looser stools. And for the 50 to 40 to 50 year olds, they've put it as change in bowel habit and rectal bleeding, so they'll get a colonoscopy. Unexplained iron deficiency anemia should be scoped, and those with family hist worrying family histories should have, be obviously referred. Not accepted are those with rectal bleeding less than 50 years old with a normal hemoglobin. Um, and so they're the ones that you can consider referral to a surgical, surgical or medical assessment. Probably surgical is going to be better. What? Oh, sorry. Um. So in practicalities, the over 50 year old pretty much going to send along for, you can refer, refer directly for colonoscopic or CT colonography. Um, if it's an obvious re you know, rectal disorder, you can refer it to us and we can decide what to do. Less than 50s, they're the ones that are a pro bit problematic. If they've got symptoms persisting greater than six weeks, consider a referral to us um, and we'll then do a proctoscopy and sigmoidoscopy. The important one of the other issues is these patients, once they've had their colon exonerated, we really don't care that much. <laughs> So bleeding, patients often focus on the bleeding. You can reassure the patient, you've got a bit of bleeding. Everybody has a bit of bleeding every once in a while. Don't worry about it. You've had your colon screened. If you've got no other symptoms, if you've had that colonoscopy, all is well. So you don't have to get too carried away about them all coming back to clinic to have a, because they have a bit of bleeding once a month. Why this whole focus on the age of 50? Um, and just to point out that colon cancer does occur under 50 and it's, but it's pretty uncommon and the rate just skyrockets after 50. Of course, there are high profile media cases like Blair Vining and the news and all that sort of thing. And certainly it does happen in under 50 year olds. So do be aware of those ones that you do have to worry about it and refer to us. So what's dangerous, obviously colorectal cancer. It's the second most common cause of cancer registration and death in New Zealand. Your patient's got a one in 20 lifetime risk. But the other thing is also anal cancer, which I mentioned. These frequently present late, but if patients come along with an ulcerated, tender, sore area around their bottom, think maybe it's not just a hemorrhoid, so think about referring it on to us. So what's not dangerous? So now in terms of the topic of the talk, I was supposed to be talking about proctology, so we'll talk a bit about that. So the anorectal causes of rectal bleeding, obviously anal fissures, and I've put that top again because it's mis often misdiagnosed and often prob probably easily treated before you send them along to us. Hemorrhoids, and then I'll bit of mention about pruritus only because that does cause bleeding. So anal fissures, you can pretty much make the diagnosis based on history. If a patient comes along and said, I've got pain, it's bright red blood, it's on the toilet paper, and when I go to the toilet, it's really painful like passing glass, you can almost guarantee they've got a fissure. It's not hemorrhoids. It's almost certainly going to be a fissure. You may not see it because they're too tender for you to part the buttocks, and you actually often have to prick give the traction quite hard, and you'll see this um, ulcer in the midline at the back usually, occasionally at the front, typically at the back though, in the midline, and that's, and you can see the internal sphincter on the base of it. So if you've got pain and bleeding, it can be an acute fissure, which will usually settle pretty quickly, but if they go on to develop a chronic fissure from having hard stools, they don't want to go to the toilet, so the stools become harder, then when they do go, it tears, and then the main issue is actually spasm in that internal sphincter, um, which leads to an ischemic ulcer, in fact. And the treatment is to soften the stools, of course. I love Consul D or the psyllium husk derivatives, and I think if anyone comes along with any anorectal problem, just give them some bloody Consul D. Um, <laughs> because it works, it does work, uh, lecture is to soften the stool, and then the other issue is to relax the internal sphincter. To relax the sphincter, you can do it pharmacologically, either with um, GTA and PACE, which is funded, um, but it does cause headaches, so that relaxes the sphincter and allows better blood flow. The other thing you can use is diltiazem ointment, 2%, 
which um, the pharmacy has to make up for you, but it avoids a headache issue. Probably for you guys, I'd try the rectogesic, and if then they, they don't tolerate it, then get them to move on to diltiazem. And you need to apply it religiously for six weeks, three times a day, to relax the sphincter and allow the he fissure to heal up. And 50 to 80% of them will be healed, but there is a really high risk of long-term recurrence because they've still got a high tension for sphincter. If that doesn't work, then they need to come along to us. Um, and now options then are to give Botox, which always keeps patients amused that they might have a better looking bottom. But um, so the Botox, we directly inject into the internal sphincter under general anaesthetic because they're too sore to tolerate it any other way. Lasts for two to four months of relaxation and generally cures really realistically 50 to 60%. For females, that would be our first option because we don't like cutting the sphincters in females because of the risk of incontinence. In males, we'd probably go straight to a lateral sphincterotomy, which is a fantastic operation at curing fissures, but has a small risk of alterations in continence. But for males, that risk is small because we've got longer sphincters and don't have babies, which is dangerous. Coming on to hemorrhoids, um, this is an overdiagnosed problem because patients often think they've got hemorrhoids because they've got a skin tag or something and they've got a bit of bleeding, so they must have hemorrhoids. Often that skin tag is actually an anal fissure and a little sentinel tag related to it. But internal or true hemorrhoids are mucosal prolapse from the mucosa above the, the dentate line in the anus coming down, which you can see in a proctoscope there. Um, and the primary problem, I believe, is the mucosal prolapse. It's not, a vent, it's not Dave's problem. It's not a vascular problem. It's just that everybody's got vascular cushions in the anus which help to close off and maintain sphincter um, integrity and continence. And the hemorrhoids are actually secondary to prolapse of those normal veins which then get congested and get a bit hypertrophied and prolapse down. And so the classic symptom is, disc, um, is bleeding, which is outlet in nature with no other symptoms. It's probably the classic symptom, just a bit of bleeding. It can be quite profuse. Um, so it's often splattering the pan and so on. And it can lead to anemia. But if patients have got an anemia related to the hemorrhoids, you <coughs> certainly want to make sure they've got nothing else causing it before you put it down to that. Prolapse, which often the patients think they've got prolapse, but in fact it's just a skin tag that they're feeling. And they say they can push it back, but they're not actually pushing it back when you have a look at it. Um, they can get discomfort, but it's really pain. Um, and they can get a bit of discharge and pruritus from the mucosa sitting there leaking a bit. In terms of management, um, defecatory advice. Ask your patients what they do in terms of going to the toilet. Often patients say, I have to go to the toilet every day at 8 o'clock. That's my routine. I have to do it. And often I have to sit there waiting for it to happen. Stop them doing that. <laughs> so get them to only go to the toilet when they have the urge. And it's amazing how many patients you find aren't doing that. To only go to the toilet when they've got, a, go, they've got the urge. They're not allowed to read on the toilet. And then start, give them some Consul D. Give them some psyllium husk. And that's remarkably good at curing a lot of their symptoms. The topical applications resolve that tenderness and mild discomfort. It maybe help the bleeding, but they're not going to make hemorrhoids go away. So patients often come and say, oh, I used this for ages and it didn't make my hemorrhoids go away. If you really want the hemorrhoids to go away, apart from the Consul D and fixing their disordered defecation, then they're going to need something to actually remove the hemorrhoids, which may be banding, which we do in the rooms or in the clinic. And that's pretty low rent um, and has low risks. Or we can do an operation, which I tell patients, if you have your hemorrhoidectomy, you're going to hate me for six weeks because it's a horrible <laughs> operation. There are newer procedures which are not quite as efficacious, like HALRA and LASER, but... Mm. <laughs> Um, anal skin tag is just a very brief mention just because I was saying about patients getting confused about what's a skin tag and what's a hemorrhoid. Skin tags aren't hemorrhoids, they're just um, these little lumps on the skin which usually are asymptomatic and usually need nothing doing. Sometimes it makes patients difficult to wipe their bottoms. But um, Perianal hematoma is another problem that you probably see quite frequently. So these are the patients who come to see you with sudden onset of pain and a lump around their bottom, and it's actually not reducible despite the patient telling you that often it is. And that's related to rupture of skin veins in the external plexus and the skin around the anus. And so they'll develop a lump like that, which is sore and horrible, but generally it'll resolve in about a week. If we get in there soon enough, within 72 hours, you can make a cut and let the blood out, and it gives some relief, but it doesn't, it's average. So it just resolves and it leaves them with a skin tag. Very brief mention about pruritus ani, which is a very common problem. 
Most of the time it's idiopathic, so it's just for a bit of dampness around the skin of the anus. You want to exclude major problems like hemorrhoids and fissures and so on. Um, I just give them a dose of Vermox, in fact, for the thread wound perhaps, um, rather than trying to find anything. And then general advice about avoiding excessive anal hygiene, <coughs> avoiding soaps, using nappy wipes rather than rubbing away too much, um, and then stopping all those steroid creams and using a zinc-based protective barrier cream. Very brief mention about abscesses and anal fistulae. These are quite common. You see them in your guys' rooms. The, um, they arise from infections in the anal glands. The um, treatment is obviously to drain them. It can be done under local anaesthetic. Often it requires a general anaesthetic. And then after drainage of an abscess, they have 10% risk of going on to develop an anal fistula. Fistulas are interesting because patients often come along with lumps around their bottom and they've been referred and people don't know what it is, but in fact it is, there's not a hole there, so it often looks like this little lump and people don't know what's going on and a bit of discharge and that'll often be the anal fistula, which the only way you're going to make that go away is, is an operation. Although if symptom, patients don't have much symptoms, we often would leave it alone. And I thought I'd better just quickly update people on the National Screening Program for Bowel Cancer. So this is a fecal immunohistochemistry test from the, from the age of 60 to 74 every two years. It's been rolled out at White and Matter quite a few years ago as a pilot scheme. The county's got it over the last year. And um, it's coming into Auckland Hospital, I think, well, Auckland DHB in um, two years' time. If they've got a positive immuno test, then they've got a 10% risk of having a cancer. 90% have some pathology of some sort, like a polyp. GPs get informed of the result of the positive test and they're asked to tell the patient refer to colonoscopy, but there's a backup method as well. Interestingly, anecdotally, since we've started screening at counties, about 50% of patients who I've seen have had bowel screen detected cancers have actually had symptoms which they should have been referred much earlier for a colonoscopy. So they've had patients, I've had patients with six months of iron deficiency anemia, patients with bleeding and pain who had obviously had cancer when you took a history. So um, take the history first. In summary, take a good horse history. Always do a rectal exam in colon creeks where cancer is common.